took me all day, but I finally built it and whoa, whoa. Oh, hi. You caught me witnessing a train wreck. Speaking of train wrecks, let's talk about Super Green Beret. Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Comic books began to emerge in the late 1930s, and a lot of the early superhero stories with Superman, Captain America, Captain Marvel had them battling Nazis. Now, this was years before America actually got drawn into the war at the very tail end of 1941. But the Nazis were a very easy to hate villain. The comic books that were featuring these superheroes from America beating them up, it was propaganda, but it was also popular entertainment. A lot of people uh, wanted America to get involved in that war before we were ever drawn in. So it was both propaganda and entertainment. But now we'll fast forward to the 1960s and America was in a very different and far less popular war. I'm talking, of course, about the Vietnam War, which was actually, of course, not a declared war for the United States. It was, in fact, a proxy war. It was capitalist countries and communist countries funding two sides in Vietnam, and that's why we were there. It wasn't very popular at home, and therefore, comic books featuring superheroes beating up Vietnamese was never really a popular idea, but that is exactly what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about an obscure comic book that was made in 1967. It was 13 years into the U.S. being involved in that war. It was not very popular. It really wasn't an idea that anybody out there wanted to see in terms of a superhero going over there to beat up Vietnamese people. Not anything anybody was asking for but it still happened. I want to talk about a completely ridiculous comic called Super Green Beret. The 1960s represented a new burst of popularity for superhero comics. One group of people that tried to get into that were two sets of brothers, Will Lieberson, Bernie Miller, Martin Lieberson, and Joe Miller. They formed Milson Publishing, named after merging their last names, and started a comic book division called Lightning Comics. It published two titles, Super Green Beret and the slightly more famous Fat Man the Human Saucer. Both were written by Otto Binder, who wrote the vast majority of the Captain Marvel stories for Fawcett Comics. His collaborator on those books was C.C. Beck, who also drew Fat Man. Fat Man lasted three issues, which was still better than Super Green Berets 2. Yes, the stories of a fat guy who could turn into a flying saucer were more popular than those of Super Green Beret. In short, a kid named Todd gets a magic hat. When he salutes, he turns into a super strong bulletproof adult who can also make anything he wishes for come true. Surprise! The guy that wrote Captain Marvel tried to do the same thing with Super Green Beret. Let's take a look at Super Green Beret's origin story and try to find out why it didn't sell that well. Hint, it's because it's not good. The first page is a splash page just giving us an idea of who Super Green Beret is and what he can do. We see him saluting and he's making monkeys and gorillas appear to fight the Viet Cong enemy. You can see that he's dressed in a U.S. Army Special Forces uniform complete with airborne insignia on the shoulder and of course the famous Green Beret. So let's be clear, this character is not in the U.S. military, but he is wearing a U.S. military uniform, uh, specifically one of the Army Special Forces, also known as the Green Berets. His name should probably be Captain Stolen Valor, because it was, and remains, a federal crime to impersonate someone in the military. This guy should be in jail. Taking a close look at the page, we can see that the titular character Super Green Beret is thinking to himself, G.I.s ambushed by the enemy. This calls for magic monkeys to appear. Presto! And throw coconuts. And how about a gorilla to tackle those Viet Cong gorillas? 
Yes, Super Green Beret can invent anything he imagines out of thin air, including apes and gorillas. Why, with these powers, he could single-handedly end the conflict there in no time at all. Instead, he just kind of teleports over there every once in a while to hassle the Viet Cong. I think another accurate name for him could be the Super Dumb Green Beret. We cut to the actual story, which began in the past. Young teenager, or maybe even preteen, Todd Holton is with his father and his father's ridiculously young wife, who never gets a name. Her brother is Roger, a Green Beret who apparently got a two-week furlough from the conflict in Vietnam. He immediately offers Todd his beret. It's glowing, but they're pretty casual about that. A bigger concern for Uncle Roger should probably be his punishment for giving away part of his uniform. The punishment would be a bad conduct discharge, forfeiture of all future pay, and up to a year in prison. Uncle Roger explains the story of his glowing beret. A few weeks ago, Roger was in Vietnam, and his platoon came across a monastery in the jungle that was being pillaged for food and supplies by the Viet Cong. The Viet Cong tries to kill the monastery's abbot by releasing a wild boar and explaining in detail what they're doing. You called us human pigs, wretch, so we will let this wild pig, or boar, chase you down in the jungle. He has been goaded into wild rage. Hey, they may be ready to steal food, but they're also going to make it very clear that a wild pig is also known as a boar. That's the only way the metaphor is going to work. Hey, you call us pigs, you'll get killed by a wild pig. Also known as a wild boar, FYI. Roger runs after the boar, not wanting to risk stray gunfire with innocent hostages. Apparently, he runs away from the hostage situation to do this because no one shoots at him. He successfully tackles a massive boar, saving the abbot's life, at least for now. Roger seems to break the boar's neck, but says he's just throwing it like a bull at a rodeo. The abbot thanks him, and Roger's men apparently massacre the Viet Cong off-panel as we hear gunfire erupt. The abbot decides to thank Roger by summoning the Jungle Wizard. The Jungle Wizard uses his magic to make Roger's beret glow, and tells him if he gives it to someone young and noble, they'll have full access to all of the Jungle Wizard's powers. Just for the record, Vietnam does not have any mythology about ancient jungle wizards. This is just playing on the old racist trope of the magical oriental old man. That said, Uncle Roger still belittles the whole experience by saying the wizard was just making up mumbo jumbo about jungle magic powers and that it's too kooky to believe. Naturally, Todd tries it out and is instantly transformed into an adult in a replica Army Special Forces uniform, accurate down to that shoulder airborne badge. I can believe in magical hats, but magical hats that recreate modern military uniforms? That is an oddly specific use for ancient magic. I also like how the colorist on this story tried to give Super Green Beret a white area for his smile, but the offset printing shifted it up to make it look like he's an old man with a mustache. Great look for his debut. Uncle Roger spends the entire page constantly stunned that the magic works. He just cannot accept what he's seeing right in front of him. I'm not sure that's a great quality for a Green Beret. Hey, it's an ambush, dive for cover. Oh, a what? It's a, it's a what? Wait, no. Really? This is, I'm, are you, sh wow, really? That's what's happening? Todd, or let's call him Super Green Beret now, tests his powers in a visually dull way. He turns some tree stumps into stone, and it seems to convince Roger, so I guess we'll just have to believe that it worked. Then the creepy jungle wizard pops up right behind Super Green Beret. He makes Super Green Beret promise to be good, which apparently means only beat up soldiers against U.S. interests. This particular jungle wizard happens to be a fan of Coca-Cola and Levi's blue jeans, baby. Todd takes off his beret and that's how his powers turn off. Roger gives him absolutely terrible advice, telling him he should keep it a secret. I would argue he could do the most good with someone experienced giving him advice, but sure, let's turn the war effort over to a little kid from the suburbs. Roger heads back to the war, and Todd realizes that if he touches his hat, he can now telepathically listen in on the battles being fought in Vietnam. He ignores most of them, and hears about some American GIs trapped in a cave. That sounds like a fun one, so he puts on his hat and teleports to Vietnam. 
Super Green Beret appears in Vietnam, where the soldiers trapped in the cave are surrounded by enemy Viet Cong forces. The locals toss some grenades into the cave, and Super Green Beret talks to his hat, telling it to transform the grenades into fruit. When the harmless fruit rolls in, the American soldiers immediately begin eating the fruit that their enemies just threw at them. If you find yourself in a war and the enemy starts tossing food at you, keep in mind they may actually be poisoning that. In other words, if you start having food thrown at you by the same people that were just shooting at you, you might want to hold off on eating it. Just a good rule of thumb. The propaganda machine hits overdrive. The Vietnamese complain about the poor weapons they've been given, so apparently we're to believe that the communist countries like China and Russia were giving them poor armaments, which just wasn't true. Also, the artist depicts the enemies in some relatively unflattering depictions that are at least bordering on racist, if not outright offensive. Somehow, the enemy knows that the Americans have run out of ammo. Super Green Beret also knows this and uses his magic to vacuum up the enemy's ammunition and put it in the Americans' ammo belts. Super Green Beret is like some sort of trickster god. With his powers, he could instantly end the conflict, and you would think that that would be a noble use of his powers. Instead, he just kind of likes to torment and tease the enemy, and he lets the battles continue. Just look at him smiling about what he's doing. The Viet Cong shoot a mortar shell that Super Green Beret turns into bouquets of flowers. He doesn't bother to tie the enemy up or scare them off. Instead, he slips into the cave to convince the American soldiers to rally. While they shoot back at the now defenseless enemy, Super Green Beret grants himself X-ray vision and spots a machine gun emplacement hidden in the undergrowth. So he jumps over and kicks the enemy in the face and smashes their heads in with their own weapon. Super Green Beret finishes off the last enemy by using what he calls judo to basically lay on his back and kick the man head first into a tree. There is no chance that he didn't crumple up his spine like an accordion. Even though he can teleport, Super Green Beret opts to escort the American soldiers back to base. He spies some enemies and trees up ahead, so he manufactures saws out of thin air that cut the branches and send them falling to the ground. Whoever survived that fall is quickly overwhelmed by the American soldiers. They have no chance against Super Green Beret's infinite magical abilities. The final challenge to getting back to an American base is a tank blocking their way. The story was made in 1967, and the Viet Cong weren't given tanks by Russia until after the 1968 Tet Offensive, but hey, it does make for a fun comic story, so we'll let this one slip away. Even though all of Super Green Beret's previous magic was made just by wishing it to be so, this time, Super Green Beret salutes the tank. It utterly confuses the American soldiers, but Super Green Beret says he's saluting the enemy for having brought a defective tank, and apparently his salute makes the tank completely break down. After knocking out the enemy, the American soldiers make it safely back to base. One of the soldiers turns to recommend a Silver Star medal, but Super Green Beret is already teleporting home, saying he isn't in this for the medals. No, why would you need a medal when you're already invulnerable and you can make up anything you imagine? He already wished himself up a full uniform. I'm pretty sure that wishing up a medal wouldn't be that big a deal. Back home, the news claims that the soldiers called their mysterious benefactor Super Green Beret, which is a little strange because he explicitly introduced himself as Captain Holton and never said the words Super Green Beret. After that, Todd would just teleport over to Vietnam whenever he felt like it, and similarly taunt the enemy. Sometimes he'd get bored of that and teleport down to South America to battle dictators. One time, he decided to go back in time and beat up Nazis just for fun. His only weakness was that he'd lose his powers if his hat fell off, similar to how Billy Batson would sometimes be gagged so that he couldn't shout Shazam. But, just like Billy, Todd would engage in ridiculously dangerous ways to escape being tied up, like swimming up to an alligator, which don't exist in Vietnam, but maybe Todd is too dumb to know that and it was a crocodile all along. Todd then twists and lets the alligator bite through the ropes binding his hands. He always manages to get his hat back just in time. 
And that's basically why this character isn't very interesting. First of all, he doesn't have the fun, cartoony art that C.C. Beck delivered with Captain Marvel, so it's missing that. But on top of that, this guy is super strong, he's invulnerable, and he can make up anything he can imagine. There are no limits to his power. That's just not interesting, because there's no conflict there. By the way, this character is also in the public domain. That means that you could make whatever Super Green Beret story that you'd like to. So that's my gift from me to you. Go nuts with it. Speaking of going nuts, let's take a quick look at the fan art that came in this week. First up, we have this cool piece by Mexican webcomic artist Gustavo Duarte. You can see more of Gustavo's comic at his website listed there. Marvin Duran illustrated a piece involving me and Infotron based on my recent review of Spider-Man's Clone Saga. You can see more of Marvin's art at his Instagram. Grimlock created some artwork where I get to live out my dream of being a Ghostbuster. And finally, Sheldon Martin contributes this comic strip, which is based on a joke from my friend Ken's movie, Knocked Up. You can see more of Sheldon's art on his Instagram. If you would like to have your artwork featured, I'm happy to share it. Just send it in to comictropes at gmail.com. Make sure it has something to do with this show, Comic Tropes. Again, I'm happy to share that with you. And then what I've always done is I've picked a winner out of uh, the uh, potential uh, fan art applicants, and I've drawn a gotchapon prize out of the gotcha pony machine that was donated to the show by Lunar Shine Store. Now, there is only one gotchapon prize left. I'm going to take a short break from giving away gotchapons. It's very time consuming for me to get to the uh, post office. I hope you understand. I am going back to Japan this November. I'll get some more gachapons at that point in time and pick up. In the meantime, I'm still happy to share your artwork. Just know that I'm taking a small break from giving away gachapon prizes. But we're still going to do it this week. And uh, let me take a look at the list here. So out of the entrance this week, um, Marvin Duran and Grimlock have opted out of being potential winners. So that leaves us with Gustavo and Sheldon. So Gustavo will be heads on a coin flip and Sheldon will be tails. Let's see who wins. All right, it is tails. Sheldon, you will win the last uh, gotcha pawn prize that I got for a little while. Let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, for the last one, I've got, you may remember these from sort of the 80s. They are pink muscle figures. They're sort of like uh, alien wrestlers. So that's a kind of cool uh, one to be able to give away. That is the last of the Gachapon prizes for now. I'm going to take a short break. But I sincerely appreciate you guys uh, watching the episodes, hitting like and subscribe, uh, supporting me on things like Patreon. So thank you very much for that. If you're interested in supporting it, the links are down below. In the meantime, just know that I've got some really cool, exciting episodes coming up, digging deep into the history of comics, doing fun, weird stuff like this, uh, looking at some foreign comics, looking at some indie comics, and definitely looking at some modern stuff too. So appreciate your support, and until next time, keep reading comics.